Good morning, everyone. Archbishop Richard Gagnon here, and this is our Friday morning report. Thank you very much for joining us this morning on the first Friday of March 2022. So, a lot of changes have been occurring in terms of our provincial protocols in the province. A uh, very positive trend, actually. You might recall that um, it was two years ago, around Ash Wednesday, that the uh, pandemic began to take its effect in our country. So, you know, our people at that time, two years ago, uh, were faced with uh, many difficulties uh, in terms of the physical aspects of the pandemic, uh, the psychological aspects of the pandemic, and also the spiritual challenges too that were present because of the shutdowns and things like that. And on top of all, on top of all of that, of course, we entered Lent uh, with the, with the Lenten discipline, and and so it was um, a very unique experience. Uh, but now with the uh, with the pandemic um, uh, winding down slowly and loosening up of protocols, we are left with the discipline of Lent, but also with the lessons that we have learned over the past two years. And hopefully, even though it's been difficult in terms of our faith, hopefully we have grown in our faith. Hopefully we have learned important lessons about prayer and family life and how to try to live our faith in spite of the restrictions of the pandemic. So here we are. We celebrated Ash Wednesday a few days ago and uh, we are entering this third Lent uh, during times of COVID but in a much more positive situation. So I sent out the other day a memo to the parishes uh, regarding the um, the protocols in Manitoba and a few of the points I'd like to make here. First of all, the, the congregations, the sizes of our congregations are now back to normal uh, except that mask wearing is still required in the province up until a certain date in March when we expect the mandate for masking will also be removed as well. But until we hear that for sure, we'll continue to wear masks while attending church. So our capacities are back to normal in our churches after a very long period of time. And uh, thanks be to God for that. Live streaming, I still encourage uh, live streaming in the Archdiocese. There are many people who are shut-ins, uh, people in nursing homes who certainly take advantage of the live streaming. And so if it is possible to dedicate one of the Masses for live streaming in our parishes, uh, we will do that. And certainly we want to continue that at the Cathedral on the first Sunday of the month. Uh, we're encouraging hand sa sanitizing stations uh, to, be, to be made available to parishioners at the entrance to the churches. And so the, uh, the, the uh, more thorough sanitizations of our churches are not necessary anymore, but we want to make available hand sanitizers at the entrance to our churches. The collection procedures will go back to normal. The normal way we take up collections our offertory processions will also be normal, the way we used to do it prior to the pandemic. Celebrations of First Communion, baptisms, reconciliation, anointing of the sick, and marriages and funerals return to normal with no restrictions. Uh, masks are still to be worn indoors, of course. And that's a great relief because it's been a very difficult time especially for families celebrating funerals and celebrating marriages as well. The celebration of confirmation now is going back to a normal schedule. I will be participating in, in confirming young people throughout the Archdiocese according to the uh, schedule that is set. And again, there's no limits to capacities for the attendance at confirmations. Uh, the, sign of peace, the sign of peace uh, will continue as a bow to the person rather than a shaking of hands for the time being. And that will continue from the previous protocols. Our communion process of going to communion, the communion processions will go back to normal 
that uh, with the use of Eucharistic ministers and of course the, the pastor uh, or parish administrator uh, will be distributing communion as people come forward to the altar. Um, holy water fonts will once again be filled and blessed water placed in the holy water fonts and the perpetual adoration chapels can now be uh, reinstated for those that have perpetual adoration with no limits to attendance to, uh, uh, to adoration in those parishes that have uh, the uh, advantage of having adoration chapels, 24-hour ad adoration or some version of that. One question came forward regarding uh, dispensation from Mass on Sundays. As of the first Sunday in Lent, the dispensation will then be lifted and the Sunday obligation is reinstated starting on the first Sunday of Lent. Now, I realize that I have received one or two communications from people who are still concerned because there's a member of their family, it could be a spouse, it could be the person themselves, that still has a bit of a compromised immune system. And they are not fully uh, at ease going back to church. Well, not to worry. Uh, there's no reason to be anxious about that at all. That's certainly, that's a medical question, that's a matter of health. And so we return to church when we feel physically able to do so, that our health will not be imperiled in any way. So I hope this answers your question. But for the majority, the vast majority of parishioners, our Sunday obligation, which is a very beautiful and very important part of our faith, will be reinstated coming this first Sunday of Lent. So thank you very much uh, for some of the letters I've received asking me about that particular question. We have a few uh, other questions this week that have come forward. Uh, the first question is this, uh, Your Grace, uh, what are some outside-the-box ideas for Lenten observances? I think there has to be something better than just giving up chocolate for 40 days. Well, thank you for the question. Obviously, for people that are addicted to chocolate, I think it would be a good thing if they do look at that might be a good thing indeed. Nevertheless, um, in all seriousness, well, there's many, many ways in which one can keep the Lenten discipline of almsgiving, prayer, and fasting for sure. You might remember, uh, for those that either attended the Ash Wednesday services or indeed uh, tuned in through live streaming, uh, the Gospel. Our Lord speaks about going into our rooms privately and praying. Uh, it's very reminiscent of the COVID experience where we had to pray at home because we didn't have quick access to churches, you know. That Lent is all about a personal, in fact, Lent is personal, our personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ and developing that relationship in prayer with our Lord. But the same goes to with regards to almsgiving. Almsgiving, yes, reaching out to those in need for sure, but we are surrounded by many needs. And when one thinks about it, you know, to be an agent of reconciliation, general kindnesses towards people can be a, a certain Lent, a Lenten discipline to focus on, uh, to bring peace to others, to be an agent of peace, uh, to be a reconciling agent, to make those phone calls we don't usually make. Uh, to bring a certain friendliness and kindness towards others within our families. Even the way we drive our cars in traffic. You know, sometimes you wonder, well, if you want proof of original sin, just watch the way traffic works and our lack of charity towards one another. I mean, there's many ways that one can give alms to others. In fact, to the poor, indeed. But almsgiving is for the poor as well. And that's where gestures of kindness, gestures of, of bringing peace to others, of forgiveness. All these things, in many different ways, are matters to consider. In regarding our prayer life, you know, to find ways of praying that we have not prayed, perhaps in a long, in a long time, the regular rosary, or take on a new devotion like the Divine Mercy Chaplet, or some other devotion during the Lenten season. 
to dedicate ourselves perhaps to reading of a certain spiritual book throughout Lent. How often do we do that? That's very important as well. Uh, to make an effort maybe to consider getting Catholic television into our homes. Normal cable TV is not necessarily healthy in terms of our spiritual life in many cases, as you well know, as we well know for sure. And in terms of the, um, the question of fasting, uh, fasting, the purpose of fasting is to rely more on God in our life. There are certain things that we become attached to. There are certain habits that we have certain things in our lives which really take us away from focusing on Christ. The whole point of Lent is developing that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. One could talk about giving up television, for example, or some other thing that we do that takes up a lot of our time in which we could substitute another activity for sure. Uh, fasting is meant to be a significant point of penance in our life and not to overdo it, of course, in terms of our health and things like that. But the whole point is spiritual. Lent is a personal experience. So I, I, these few thoughts that I offer you today, and they're very general categories that I've mentioned, hopefully responds to your question about out-of-the-box approaches to Lent. And certainly giving up certain kinds of foods is also part of that. But what do we take on in Lent? What do we add to our spiritual life. You know, when water is, to use a strong term, not to offend people, but if water is polluted, if water is not clean, how do we fix that? Well, we keep pouring in fresh water, fresh water, fresh water. Almsgiving, prayer, and fasting are the disciplines of Lent, which are fresh water in our life to improve our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our second question is this. Hello, Your Grace. When it comes to the Synod, who will participate in the larger meetings across the country? Will it be the bishops or delegates from various dioceses that go? I take it by your question, you are referring to the meeting of the Synod in Rome in 2023. Well, in terms of those that go, well, certainly the president of the CCCB and possibly a delegate from the CCCB will certainly be going but there'll be other people in attendance as well, and that is yet to be decided. So I don't really have that question for you. Um, an interesting part of that, though, is that last October, I was invited to go to Rome to participate in the opening of the Synod. And in the same room where the, the Synods are held in Rome, a very interesting experience, there were many, many lay people from around the world that were there, both youth and people of all ages, and there was a breakout session in which we met in small groups. I was with a group of young people and uh, a few older people from different countries talking about synodality. So my guess would be is that there'll be more lay people involved in the synod that will be coming up in 2023. So that's all the information I have for you at present. But thank you for your question and do keep in tune. And our last question, number three, is a much shorter one and uh, maybe it's easy to answer, I don't know. Are choirs permitted under the new public health orders? Well, yes, choirs are permitted now because congregations have no limit to them. Uh, in terms of wearing masks, uh, people in choirs, uh, I've seen myself, my own experience, um, but people in choirs uh, don't seem to have too much objection at this point to singing with masks on, um, that's fine. That's fine if they can do that. I would, uh, that's certainly to be encouraged. But if there's a soloist, perhaps a soloist can sing without a mask. I would, I would phrase it like that. So choirs, yes, for sure, with masks, yes. But when there's a cantor or a soloist, without masks. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Well, this past week has been very, very trying for us uh, in our country. Um, as we heard news about the about Ukraine and about the war, and um, and so we have many Ukrainian people here, uh, Catholic Ukrainian, Orthodox Ukrainian, and so this is a very, very, very difficult time. And I think we want to be in. Um, 
in union with them, first of all, in our prayer life. Uh, we need to pray for peace. Now, I've listened to the patriarch of Catholic Ukrainians speak about prayer. Pray for the people in Ukraine who are suffering the bombardments and the many refugees and families that are disturbed. But also pray for the Russian people at this time as well. And pray for peace, that a resolution to this terrible conflict will occur. I would say that we should be encouraged seriously during Lent to really make this part of our Lenten devotion uh, with a charitable heart. Uh, to pray for the people of Ukraine, pray for peace, pray for Russia, pray the family rosary together, or pray the rosary individually. In parishes, find time maybe before Sunday Mass or Masses during the week to pray for peace in the Ukraine. We can use this time of Lent, this spiritual time, to really be prayer warriors in our country. And remembering our own people here in Canada, the Ukrainian people, many of whom have relatives in the old country to offer up masses for peace and also maybe holy hours we can organize. So I really think that parishes need to, on their own, uh, to uh, develop prayerful support for peace in Ukraine, for sure. In terms of sponsorship of refugees, I understand as of this morning, Friday morning, that there's more than a million people now have left Ukraine for other countries for safety. This is the largest movement of refugees in the 21st century. It's very, very profound. Canada is going out of its way to streamline its uh, policies regarding refugees to assist Ukraine and to assist these refugees. There's a whole series of uh, questions and pieces of information relative to assisting refugees uh, into Canada. And I refer you to the number at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this number comes from the Immigration Refugees Citizenship Canada. And the number is uh, 1613-321-4243. The number is there. Uh, and uh, that number will provide certainly a lot of information for you with regard regards what is possible. The Archdiocese of Winnipeg is a sponsorship holder. We can take refugees. It's still early to say how this may work, but certainly our Archdiocese will assist in any way it can our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. I just received this update this morning, uh, or rather yesterday morning. It says here the government is starting a new path where it is doing away with a lot of visa requirements. Those who want to come to Canada and then return to Ukraine, they can come for two years. Also, they are establishing a process for those who wish to come and stay. The situation is ever changing. And um, as that situation does change, uh, the question of refugees into Canada, more information will be given to you when that information is made available. Okay, so let's use our Lenten time to support our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and pray for peace. Finally, uh, we are looking in the Archdiocese for an Associate Director for uh, Catechetics in the uh, Westman and Parkland deaneries, um, the area towards Brandon, Manitoba. The part-time position will assist catechetics in those rural deaneries and work under our director of catechetics here in the Archdiocese of Winnipeg. So I just mentioned that there may be somebody within hearing distance of this Friday morning report, who may have some ideas on that. Uh, and uh, there is a job description with what is required for that position. Well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, a lot of information this morning uh, for our Friday morning report. I thank you very much for tuning in today and being part of this. And many of you are very faithful over the years in following the Friday morning reports. 
It's an opportunity for me to speak with the people of the Archdiocese and respond to their questions. The Lord be with you all. And may God bless and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.